Hello everybody. If you're a petrol head on the hunt for your next sensible, but still kind of fun daily, you would think that was an easy task. And once upon a time, it was. The classifieds were littered with cars that were both practical and fun. These days, that's becoming an increasingly difficult thing to find, thanks to the rise of the crossover and the 4x4. Yes, they might be nice and big and imposing, and in some cases practical, but they often aren't really that exciting to drive. What used to be the default go-to car was the estate. I love a fast estate. They are brilliant things, great looking, practical, and they handle nicely. All of the benefits of the 4x4 and none of the real drawbacks, because let's be honest, do you take your SUV off-road? Didn't think so. And if you do, great, go and buy one of those. But you're then one of the five people in this country who actually genuinely need one. Now, if you also want to buy a car that's not from one of the typical German brands, your choices are even more limited. And in fact, you've probably in this country really only got one, Jaguar. Unfortunately, the regular car lineup from Jaguar of late has been starting to look a little bit threadbare. The XC and XF are now half a decade old. The F-Type, also not really a practical car, but still one of the core lineup, is now approaching its seventh birthday with no real replacement in sight. And their engine lineup has recently been decimated too. Their imperfect but characterful V6 petrol is gone. The promised straight-six Ingenium petrol has yet to arrive, leaving the XE exclusively with a lineup of four-cylinder engines and the XF the carrier of Jag's sole current production V6, a three-litre diesel. And that's what we have here today. In this hypothetical world where I might one day buy a brand new sensible car, on paper, this XF sport brake would almost certainly be it. Unlike the XC, which I was a little indifferent about in terms of looks, I think this is a stunning thing to behold. Really striking, subtle enough, but classy. A real Jag, in other words. And that 3.0-litre V6 produces 300 horsepower and 700 newton meters, or just over 500 pound-foot of torque. Plenty enough to carry whatever it is that you want. And it promises 40 miles per gallon potential and it meets all current emissions regs. So it's got a lot going for it. This engine is paired to the ubiquitous eight-speed ZF gearbox, a generally fantastic thing, but it powers only the rear wheels. And that is the first of Jaguar's many strange decisions when it comes to the XF. The diesel model below this, the 240, is all-wheel drive only. And the P300 petrol engine, as in the XE that I drove, is also all-wheel drive only. This produces way more torque than either of those, and if ever there were a car in the lineup that should be all-wheel drive, this is it. And that isn't the only strange thing about the XF compared to the XE either. Take these headlights, for instance. In isolation, nothing really wrong with them. Very good, nice LED units. But the XE gets the nice proper matrix system which cuts a hole in the light for the oncoming traffic and works very well indeed. This has no such feature. In fact, the only bonus these give you is a nice J-shape daylight running light. And the XF is supposed to be the top model. It's not just lights that are a bit of an odd choice either. 2003 called and it wants its heads up display back. I don't know who approved this, but it is shockingly bad. A 1200 pound option you definitely do not want to tick. The same goes for the interactive driver display in here, another option. I don't know quite what it is, but there are a few manufacturers out there who seem to think that you can just make one of these by simply emulating the analog dials you had before. Well, that's not the point. You need to do something different, something innovative, if you're gonna make this sort of change to a car's interior. And frankly, Jaguar have missed a trick here. As standard, you get three little dials in there, and the one on the left when they ship you the car just says Jaguar. That's a massive waste of space. Now you can get this to show you a nice big map, but then all the other displays look a bit wrong and a bit iffy, and, and the whole thing just doesn't work. I think for a car like this, the old pair of nice analog dials with a screen in the middle, perfect. Fortunately, the rest of the interior fares a little bit better. 
This car has the new for 2019 screen in the middle, which is much more responsive than in the XE. It's got this beautiful trim here, a feature which goes all the way from the doors to the center of the dash at there. And it's very, very nice. Nice quality, soft leather, nice stitching. And generally, this does feel like a more premium place than the XE. It's got a Meridian surround system in here, which is part of a pack that gives you a few different things. It's in some ways the same system as in the XE, but it does seem to work a little bit better in here. It's not brilliant, but it is the best I've heard in a Jag so far. The back is very good. You've got plenty of legroom for passengers. These seats will fold flat if you need to store things. And you've even got heating back here too in this particular car. The leather is a very good quality and this full panoramic roof means that it doesn't feel claustrophobic in here either. It's all very nice. It's just a shame they couldn't bolt it down properly. The boot is a good size and this car is not short on the tech front either. You have, of course, electric tailgate. You've also got an electrically deployable tow bar and you have a couple of nice gimmicks too if you're of the sort of adventure mindset. Where are you, little fella? There we go. So, you can, let's say, tow your kayak down to the river, and then when you get there, Jaguar have a genius solution for you. If you're the sort of person that's worried about getting your car key wet, you know, running, swimming, cycling, canoeing, any of that sort of stuff, what you do? You leave this in the car, and you instead put this on your wrist. This is the Jaguar Activity Key. So this is hidden in there somewhere, and then when you want to lock the car, you simply hold it up against the J here, car locks, you go off, enjoy your sporty activities like I know I would, and then you come back and unlock with this. Don't laugh. This car is equipped with Jaguar's dual view touch screen. I must confess I haven't really been able to get it to work properly, but that's probably because I've been sat in the wrong seat. Uh, one cool thing this car comes with though is these. It's a pair of wireless headphones, and I assume you can get more of them, meaning that your passengers wearing these can listen to something entirely different to everyone else. If you've got kids, I'm sure that is probably of great benefit, and it's, I gotta say, pretty damn cool. However, with the XE, it wasn't really the interior or the car's features that sold me on it. It was the way that it drove. Is the XF the same? In short, no. This car has some very, very odd characteristics. Allow me to demonstrate one. Here we have a small speed hump. You may or may not have been able to hear that, but as you go over it, the car goes doo -doo -doo -doo, doo -doo -doo -doo. Now, now I've been over that speed hump in a number of vehicles, including some very sporty ones, and none of them quite did that. I judge cars using fairly basic criteria. You're quite unlikely anytime soon to see a JM score appearing on the channel. I ask two simple questions. Number one, does the car do what it sets out to do? And number two, is there something else out there that's better at doing that? In terms of this car, it's got a fairly easy remit. It's just got to carry you, your passengers, and your luggage from A to B in reasonable comfort, or as Jaguar might like to put it, grace, space, and pace. Something in which they have excelled for many, many years. This, though, fails pretty spectacularly when it comes to the simplest of tasks. It is very cold out there. It's currently five degrees and it was only one degree when I left this morning. But just moving around town at sensible speeds, this thing is one of the most difficult cars I have driven this year. Of all of the vehicles I've driven, including some very high power rear wheel drive cars that I've driven in winter, this is the one that's had the biggest traction issues. This thing loves spinning the rear, and not only does it do that, it does it in a very uncontrolled fashion. You get serious axle tramp in this thing. It's mind boggling that Jaguar could allow this car out the factory in its current condition. What makes this even more frustrating is that when you look at all of the ingredients Jaguar have put into this car, they're nearly all brilliant. 
The engine is, in of itself, very good indeed. It produces a hefty shove of torque from about 1400 RPM and revs to about four and a half. Unlike some of the Audi power plants that I've experienced recently, there is nearly no delay in the engine itself. It's got, once you're beyond about 1600 RPM, pretty much instant pickup. Very good. At about 70 or 80 mile an hour, it starts to tail off, but up to that point, it is very rapid indeed. The gearbox is also very good. That ZF8 speed, we all know that it's a fantastic box. But the engine and the gearbox do not talk to each other. They do not cooperate. I don't know who programmed this gearbox, but I cannot imagine that it was programmed for this specific engine because it just doesn't seem to understand the way that the engine works. A big diesel engine like this, it relies on torque. It's all about that low down mid-range torque. There is no point, none, in revving this engine out beyond about 3000 RPM. It'll do it, but you're not gaining. When you put your foot down in this car in normal drive mode, its first instinct is to change down a gear. That creates a big problem. What it should do is simply leave things alone. You know, you're doing 30, 1400 RPM, put your foot down, you have half a second or a second of delay, and it should just waft away. But what it does is it goes, oh crikey, the foot's been put down, let's change a gear. So as the engine starts to come alive, the car then suddenly changes gear, meaning that you don't just simply make decent progress, you just go, whoop, wah! And I've done this many, many times in this car. It's very undignified, very un-Jaguar, I would say. Sport mode actually makes it even worse because sport mode maintains better RPM, maintains more appropriate RPM for sporty driving, but then it's even keener to change even more gears, making it even lumpier, even bumpier, and even worse. The best way to drive this car is by just feathering the throttle, giving it about 25%, and then the car lets the engine do what it can and leaves the gearbox alone, and that is absolutely the best thing for it. Now, you could say, well, why don't you just drive it in manual mode? Well, it's not very enjoyable to drive in manual mode because you are constantly then changing gear because it doesn't rev very high. I don't want to drive a car like this in manual mode. That's not what it is for. Arr! Honestly, this is the most mismatched drivetrain I have experienced all year. Quite frankly, they are such a bad fit for each other, I think the only reason they're staying together is for the sake of the kids. It gets worse too, because when you're then presented with a gorgeous, beautiful road like this with some lovely twisty bends, the chassis is fantastic, absolutely wonderful. Jaguar are class leaders in terms of suspension setup. Nobody else can match them barring perhaps Lexus. You've got double wishbone up front and Jaguar's integral link, which is a form of multi-link, at the rear. It's brilliant. This car, the S, has a sport setup and even on these 20 inch wheels, it's actually a pretty decent ride. The portfolio with the normal comfy suspension and 19s should be fantastic. Now, I have to make an apology. A good friend of mine has spent a long time this morning cleaning this car so we could give you some nice clean car for the drive-bys. Uh, it's dirty now and it's about to get dirtier. spend ages cleaning those cameras later. Mm. Well, sorry Jag, we did clean the car for you. Oh, well, never mind. Where was I? Yes, steering. Wonderful. The, the, the car has loads of modes. The car has loads of them, but honestly, I've just left it in normal. I've played with the dynamic settings, but in this particular car, actually, I don't like any of them. Normally in some cars I have a mixture of the comfort and dynamic settings, but in this, honestly, I don't want anything in dynamic. The dynamic throttle is just too sharp, too jerky. The dynamic gearbox, again, same thing, just too keen to change, and then it's too abrupt when it does, and it's just not that kind of car. Dynamic steering, too heavy, and the regular steering is great enough anyway. The dynamic suspension, again, is just on the cusp of that sort of sporty, comfy crossover, and I'm, I'm quite happy with how Jaguar currently have it set up.
in terms of the boring stuff, this car over the last 675 miles has averaged 37.1 miles to the gallon, which is all right. We're on winter diesel, which usually means your MPG suffers a little bit, and they claim about 40 for this car. So they're close enough to what they claim for me to be happy. It's not stellar figures, but honestly, I have been noticing in this sort of modern day and age of WLTP and all that sort of stuff, we just aren't getting the ridiculous MPG figures that we used to, and I think we probably never will again so just got to live with that and that's a mixture of town country city driving i've taken this car into central london where it did very well indeed sound system all that stuff as mentioned in the walk around is is, is nice enough and everything here kind of works i've mostly been using android auto this week and it's a pleasant place to do the miles it's just at, at each end the, the round town slow stuff it's not very, very good. And then the problem is, when you then want to try and use that brilliant chassis, the engine gets in the way of your fun because it's just not a setup for that kind of thing. And I could forgive that. I could entirely forgive that if for all of the other stuff, it was simply brilliant, but it just isn't. And it's so painful because it's just configuration. It's just setup. Why is this car rear-wheel drive? I don't know. That's the problem. Give it a proper limited slip diff or, more appropriately, just put the all-wheel drive system on it that you put on everything else. 10, 15 years ago, granted, most of your competition in this country, the BMWs, Mercs, all that stuff, they were not all-wheel drive. It was only really Audi that committed to it. Nowadays, everyone's buying a BM X drive, even if it's in a car that completely doesn't need it. The number of 320D X drives out there is crazy, but that's what the market demands, so give that to them. And, and your, your Jaguar Land Rover, all-wheel drive is your jam. That's what you do so well. You're so proud of telling everyone that you're better at it than everybody else, because in many ways, you are. The XF certainly feels like a step up in quality over the XE. It's missing some of the tech, which is very confusing, but there's no doubt of the fact that it is certainly the more premium car, which makes things like the slightly unusual build quality a little bit less forgivable. What this V6 does though, for me, is just highlight how badly Jaguar need that straight six petrol. The XE was the same, and actually this is probably even worse for it, because the XE with the little four cylinder, actually you could kind of get on with it eventually, but it had some issues. This thing is crying out for a decent, big straight six petrol. Put that engine in this car, and you are onto a surefire winner, because it's all the difficult stuff, like making a two-ton car enjoyable, that you've got right. Whack that straight six in here, give it all wheel drive, and then you've got a brilliant car. The tech will come, I'm sure. I mean, look, Jaguar are currently working on an R&D budget of some beans. So I'm kind of going to give them a, a little bit of a free pass for a few quirks and features, but there is stuff that they can definitely sort with this that shouldn't really cost anything. And so for that reason, I wouldn't say discount the XF from your search, but just drive one before you buy to see if you get on with it. As a driver's tool, it is probably the best estate out there. It just needs a good engine. So there we go, the Jaguar XF V6S Sport Brake. A car that's confused me more than any other I've driven. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment below, subscribe if you haven't already, and we'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.